stumbling lords, flying sandwiches and that horrible carriage trip. The queen and her loyal subjects look back in wonder at a day they'll never forget. The epitome of grace, dignity and tremendous majesty, Elizabeth II gave a display of composure at her 1953 coronation that entranced the nation, a solemn and deeply religious ceremony that the young queen regarded as the start of her life as Sutheran. To the 300 million viewers of what would prove the first globally televised event, which took place 65 years ago this summer, it was a triumph of organization and planning. Yet as the Queen discloses to royal commentator Alastair Bruce in a wry, and extremely rare, conversation to be screened on BBC One on Sunday night, events did not always run smoothly, not least the bone-jarring ride in a golden coach from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey that she describes as horrible. She recalls, too, how she was almost brought to a standstill when her heavy ceremonial robes caught on the thick carpet laid in the abbey. Indeed, for all the undoubted majesty of the occasion, there was a great deal more that did not go to plan in the three-hour ceremony. The garter knights were clumsy with the canopy for the anointing, for example, and the odd pack of sandwiches fell out of coronets as peers put them on, and at the homage, the 25th Lord Modrate, Segrave and Stoughton stumbled as he walked backwards. When the Archbishop of Canterbury, Geoffrey Fisher, later described him to the Queen as the comic piece in the whole proceedings, she agreed, adding, with mothballs and pieces of vermin flying in all directions. I in tenant, the scattish businessman and trusted friend of the royal family, served as an usher at the ceremony but suffered a wardrobe malfunction. As he sat down on the steps by the choir stalls, he split his trousers up the back, a nearby peeress said, if you want a needle and thread, I have one in my coronet. Princess Alice, Countess of Athlone, shared her carriage with Princess Marie Louise, who had been desperately thirsty and poured herself a generous glass of water from a flask and quacked it down just before they left the abbey. Unfortunately, it was neat gin and went straight to her head. On the drive back, she nearly fell out of the coach and her tire slipped as she leaned out of the window. That the event went as smoothly as it did was perhaps thanks in part to the 16-month delay between the death of George V.I. at the age of 56 and his daughter's coronation to allow for a period of mourning. There was plenty of time for planning. Would divorced peers be summoned, for example? That question was answered by the Duke of Norfolk, the Earl Marshal. Of course, this is a coronation, not royal Ascot. The more difficult question was the role that Prince Philip would play. The Queen was determined to include her consort as much as possible and he was appointed to chair the coronation commission, though the real power was left in the hands of the Duke of Norfolk. Should the Queen curtsy when presented to the people seated on each of the four sides of the abbey? Prince Philip thought not, saying, you ought not to curtsy to your subjects. However, the Queen said she had already done so at the opening of Parliament. In the end. The four half curtsies were among the most graceful and moving moments of the coronation. The issue of televising the service preoccupied everyone for months. Initially the Queen and her advisers were against it, on the ground it would put her under additional strain and that any mistakes or undignified behavior would be seen by millions and could not be censored. Then there were the problems of how to squeeze 8,000 guests into the Abbey. For six months beforehand it was closed as workmen laid a railway track down the center to bring in tons of wood and steel to create seating areas for guests, the orchestra and choir. The most notable omission from the guest list was the Duke of Windsor, who had abdicated the throne only 16 years earlier. Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill insisted his presence was inappropriate and the Windsors were left to watch the coronation on television in Paris. Less pomp for Charles II as courtiers plan fast crowning by Sarah Oliver for the Mail on Sunday. Prince Charles's coronation will be significantly different from previous ceremonies, the Mail on Sunday has established. Advisors drawing up plans, known as Operation Golden Door, have decided the event should be shorter and less formal than the Queen's to reflect changing times. It will also take place sooner after her death than past tradition has dictated. The Queen was crowned 16 months after the death of George V.I. to allow a suitable period of mourning. Sources close to the planning committee have indicated that Charles's coronation will remain Christian and Anglican, and he will still bear the title Defender of the Faith, despite reports he would be Defender of Faith given his fascination with other religions. Charles has no formal role in planning his own service, 
but it seems likely he will agree that his mother's three-hour ceremony in June 1953, which was attended by 8,000 dignitaries, would no longer be in keeping with the times. So while many guests will be traditionally robed, others may attend in morning suits instead of court dress. His coronation is also expected to last less than half of the three hours the Queen's service took. Operation Golden Orb has been planned in fine detail, including the technology needed to broadcast the ceremony to billions of viewers around the world. However, fewer people will be inside Westminster Abbey to watch in person, partly down to health and safety fears. An extra row of seating erected with scaffolding that accommodated peers and foreign royals in 1953 cannot now be used. The nature of the congregation will also differ. There will be a purge of peers in favor of citizens who have contributed to public life, such as representatives from Charles's favored charities. Plans for the coronation were drawn up more than a decade ago but are constantly updated. The secret committee overseeing them works without interference from Buckingham Palace and Clarence House and is chaired by the Duke of Norfolk, who serves as Earl Marshal and is in charge of all state ceremonial events involving the monarch.